this morning. We're going to be going through the book of James, and as you can see uh, by the banners and the cards, we're calling it Faith That Works, and that's going to be worked out. That's going to be talked about throughout this series as, as we develop a faith in Jesus. Um, we're going to see that that plays a work in our lives and also that it should be revealing itself to work itself out in the lives of others. And as we jump into this book of James, you know, James, uh, the brother of Jesus, the leader of that first church uh, that that was happening, he was considered considered the leader. Uh, James chapter 1 is going to be kind of a, an overview, uh, what, kind of what we're talking about today as we go through the book of James. Uh, James chapter 1 gives us uh, little snippets of what he talks specifically later on. And, uh, and, and just as you're turning there in your Bibles, James chapter 1 is where we're going to start. Um, I want to see if you can relate with me on something for a second. Um, it's something I'm guilty of quite often. Uh, sometimes we associate it with kids, uh, if we have kids, them being guilty of this quite often. Uh, but I find myself, I'm guilty of this quite often, and that's this. I might be um, walking up the stairs in our house, and um, Jamie might say something to me from the living room like, hey, watch out, your socks are on the stairs. Okay, thanks. Thanks. And I walk over the socks. Thanks for the warning. I didn't slip on the socks. But I didn't, I didn't do it. She was really asking me, right? She was, she was asking me to do something there, right? She was implying, you got something in the way, it's yours. Please pick that up, right? But instead of me picking up what she was putting down, I just stepped over it. And, and, and maybe... You, and, and there's lots of different scenarios that we can relate that to. Um, I, I don't leave my socks on the stairs. I just, just want to throw that out there. I leave them out in my room. Um, uh, you know, there's lots of different scenarios where, where we see something. Maybe we notice it, but we don't act on it. We say, oh, that's there. Let me walk around it now. And I want you to keep that in mind as we, as we go through the James chapter 1 this morning. We're going to read it, read it in sections and talk about it. So we're going to start with the first uh, 11 verses. James chapter 1, uh, 1 through 11, says this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat. And withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So we're going to stop there for just a second. We want to walk through these verses before we continue on with what James is, is talking about. James just kind of starts out, he, he doesn't give much, of, you know, Paul, when he writes his letters, he, he kind of writes a few verses worth of greeting. James is like, hey, I'm a servant of God, let's go. And he starts out with trials. <laughs> like, hey, when you're going through hard things, be happy. What? 
What are you talking about? Yeah, that's what in verse 2 he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And so what we want to uh, talk about today, you know, first we see that trials, number one in your, in your outline, trials are the testing, or another way of putting it is approving, or a revelation of our faith. He says, um, uh, count on all joy, in verse 3 he says, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So, so we, can, we can know, he's not saying if you get punched in the face, smile and laugh. Yay, I love getting punched in the face. That's not what James is saying. He's saying when you're going through a trial in life, you can know, you can still have joy through that trial, through that valley. Why? Because you know that it's going to produce something good in your life in the end. It's going to prove where you're at currently. Trials are a test. What are tests for? To see where you're at currently. When you go through a trial, it's a revelation of where you are with your walk with Christ. So when he says um, it's going to produce, it's going to test you in this. It's going to reveal, you know, it's like those hypotheticals. What would you do if? We don't know until we're in it. We can guess how we might react to certain things. But until we go through that thing, we won't know. That's the test. And so when we go through these trials, James says, man, you know what? That's good because now at least you'll know where you're at and then you'll be able to work on it if, if, if you start to stumble. But it might reveal, man, I have more faith in God than I thought I did. It's a proving ground. It's a trial. We, what, is it, what does it reveal? Um, it reveals, number two, that it produces steadfastness, or in your version, it might say endurance. And this isn't talking about physical endurance. Um, you know, I heard from one of our teenagers, their dad went on a 15-mile run yesterday, and I was like, man, I'm jealous. I went for four. <laughs> Way to go for 15. Um, not talking about Physical endurance is talking about being able to endure the things that TJ and Lily are talking about. That's a spiritual endurance. When you see things happening in your life, am I still going to endure? Am I still going to go on following Jesus? Or am I going to am I going to bow out? It's going to produce endurance. Number three, he starts talking about. Wisdom, you know, verse 4, he said, continue to endure so that other things will continue to form as well. And then in verse 5, he, he, he asks this question. I love it. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, if you lack wisdom, hello, yes, we all lack wisdom. Every single one of us, if we were to get together one-on-one -on -one and we start having a conversation and I were to ask you, do you feel you're like wise or do you feel you need more wisdom from God if we're honest we're saying oh my goodness I messed this up and I made the wrong decision there I made the wrong man yes I need more wisdom of course I need more wisdom so the fact that James says if you lack wisdom it's kind of a funny thing that he's doing there he's like, if you lack wisdom which I know you all do here's what you do here's the solution ask of God he gives it out generously. That's number three. He gives this wisdom generously to everyone that wants it. Well, if that's true, why do we keep making such unwise decisions? James tells us that Jesus is waiting to pour out God's wisdom on everyone that would desire it. And yet we still continue to make unwise decisions. He doesn't say to muster up some wisdom or read the best books out there. He says, ask the giver of wisdom for wisdom. So why do we make these unwise decisions? I, I firmly believe we don't ask God for wisdom in many situations. 
because we already know the answer. We're faced with a situation and and you're thinking about praying, praying, what, God, what would, you, what would you want me to do here? But you already know what he would want you to do, so we don't ask because we don't want to hear the answer and we want to do what we want to do. We don't want to follow that wise counsel because we want to follow our own cans- counsel. Verse 6, he talks about asking in faith and not doubting. He says the person... Um, uh, the doubt in question here is not the what that we're praying for. You're praying for uh, someone might be sick. Uh, Lord, heal this person. My faith is not in the healing of that person. My faith is the healer. My faith is in the one who can heal. I know that's a big uh, blank there. Sorry, you know, but my faith is in the who. If I'm putting my faith in the what, my faith will always waver. Because I don't know God's will, I don't know what's best for me in my situation. I need to trust the one who sees past, present, and future. I need to trust the one who sees what's best for me when I don't necessarily know what's best for me. And I don't always know what's best for you. I need to trust that God knows what's best for you. So when I pray... My faith is in him, that he will do what is best, not in the necessarily what I'm praying for. Yes, God, I want you to hear my heart, hear my desire, but ultimately I trust you. Jesus prayed this way in the garden. He said, if there's any way for this cup of suffering to pass from me, I, I I choose option A. However, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus trusted the Father. For that, his faith was in the who. And then he talks about, you know, someone that does doubt the who, the person that doubts that God can do anything is not going to receive anything. The person that doubts that God can do anything is not going to receive anything from him. He doesn't have your trust, and you need to take care of that first before asking him for anything. Before we come to him asking him for anything, we need to first take care, do I trust him in everything? Have I surrendered my life to him in everything? He then talks about verse 9 and 10. He he said, blessed are the, the poor. He says, the poor believer can rejoice because all over scripture it talks about God blessing the poor. And then vice versa, it says the rich believer can rejoice because all over Scripture it talks about God humbling the rich. So he's saying, hey, we all have something to be rejoicing about. You rejoice because God lifts you up. You rejoice because God is granting you humility, which some of us would be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't, I don't want humility. That means I have to be humbled. Yeah. I don't know about you. Looking back, and I I think this is a good exercise for us to look back on our lives from time to time, I am so thankful for the times that God has humbled me. I started to think of myself as more than what I was, and God would just bring something to just, hey, remember who you are, and remember who I am. And that's a blessing, so we can rejoice in that. Verses 12 through 18 says this. Verse 12 says, uh, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth, by the word of truth, 
that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Here's what it's talking about in this, in this section, verse 12. It says that trials produce endurance. So remain proven during a trial. And at the end, receive that blessing. So we know that trials produce endurance. So continue to prove yourself. Continue to remain faithful during the trial. And at the end, you can know that you'll receive a blessing from him. In verse 13, he goes on, and he says, as we go through the trial, we, can't, we don't blame God for temptations. God allows trials in our lives, but God will never tempt us for sin. And there's a difference between a trial and a temptation. A trial is something you go through that tests us. A temptation is something that's tempting you to sin. And so these verses make it very clear that, uh, number two, God can't be tempted with evil, and God will not tempt anyone else for evil. He says, don't, don't blame God for those things that are, that, that are tempting you for sin. That's not from him. And that's a principle, that's a truth that we find in Scripture that we can take. It's a, it's a timeless principle that doesn't go away. God will not tempt me for sin. And then it clarifies, well, if God isn't the one tempting me to sin, who is? And we find our answer in verse 14. It says our temptation comes when we are enticed by the desires that are already within ourselves. You know, we, li- we like to blame a lot of other things for our temptation when we sin. We like to blame other things a lot. We're really good at that as a society. Well, they said this, or he did that. Did you see how they talked to me? I had to respond the way I did. I had no... We blame um, other people. We blame just society in general. We blame TV. We blame social media. We even blame some people who are like, Satan made me do it. We, we blame so many other things or people, but let's be clear, the results of that sin and that sin nature still linger within us. We don't have it. If, you, if you're a follower of Jesus, the sin nature is dead but it is still deadly. The re, the, that still lingers within us. You know, when, when you kill a poisonous snake, the snake is dead, but there's still poison in those fangs, and you don't want to step on the fangs. They will still give you that poison. In the same way, that sin nature is dead, but still deadly. Until we're in heaven, we will have no lingering Uh, results of that sin nature, but right now we have to wrestle against it Uh, all over scripture. It talks about this battle between um, following Jesus or or the that that old sin nature, and we we have this constant struggle, but what we see here in verse verse 14 is that we we tempt ourselves 95% of the time. If I look back on this last year and all of the times that I gave in to temptation or sin or whatever it was, how many people can I actually blame for this other than myself? But that is the temptation when we give in to that voice, even if it's our own. And, and when we give a voice... Number three, when we, or number four, when we give a voice to temptation and give room in our hearts to entertain that temptation, it blossoms into sin when we act on that temptation and we give in. We make the choice to give in to that temptation, which most likely came from ourselves in the first place. We act sometimes as if we had no choice we act sometimes as if I, that's just what I did. I, I, just was, I was just walking along and it happened. And God is saying, I gave you a choice to choose me 
I gave you the Holy Spirit. Throughout that entire temptation, he was speaking to you. He was saying, get out of the situation. And you made a choice. Sometimes you make the choice and you say, oh, let me get out of this situation. And you say yes to me. And sometimes you say, hmm, I really just want to do this now. But it is a choice. Make no mistake. And that's what James is telling us. He's getting rid of our excuses as he's, as he's giving us the scripture, as he's writing this letter. He's saying we're with those excuses don't work with God. He knows the truth. He knows that you choose what you want to do. You choose whether you want to follow Jesus or you choose whether you don't want to follow Jesus. But it is your choice. And he goes on at the end there. He, he talks in verse 18. He, talks, he, he wraps it up with the gospel. And he says the best thing that God ever did for us was to provide salvation through Jesus. And this is the gospel. This is the good news of the Bible. Is Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. He made a choice to, to put himself on the cross, to, to, to look at all of humanity and say, man, God and man are separated because of man's sin. And the only resolution, the only way for that is to, to sacrifice myself on the cross and place all of the sins of mankind on my shoulders and when, and when he chose to do that, even though we know that physically, in the garden, he was, that doesn't sound fun to me, God. Can we do, is there any other solution? And God said, the Father said, no, there's no other solution. That's the only solution, is that a perfect God sacrificed himself for an imperfect people. And that would bring together that relationship as it was intended in the Garden of Eden again. We were never intended to be separated from God. But our sin does just that. Our sin separates us from God, and Jesus provided the only solution for that. And he says, I love you so much, I'm willing to sacrifice myself, knowing that the majority of people that would ever live on this earth would look at that thing that Jesus did of sacrificing himself on the cross. They would look at that and they'd say, thanks, but I'm good. Or, Thanks, but no thanks. Or thanks, maybe later I'll get around to it. He thought of everyone. He said, I still need to provide it for those that will say yes to me. And that would bring about salvation of our souls. Now verse 19 through 27. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God. The Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So in other words, you know, he starts out, now that you, will, now that you know you are going to have trials, it's no secret, you're going to have trials in this life. Now that you know you're going to have trials, and, and, and that how we go through those trials reveals or proves our faith and produces endurance, and that even, even though wisdom is available, we tend not to ask for it because we tend to tempt ourselves away from that wisdom. But we have the gospel now, and salvation comes through the good news of Jesus Christ. Therefore, that's why, that's why he starts off, 
uh, in 19, he's saying, know this, my beloved brethren. He said, therefore, ni- verse 19, we need to make earnest intentions to listen to those around us. And in and, and verse, really verse 19, 20, and 21 are talking about this. And, and he says, uh, number one there, as we listen to people, we need to actually hear them. And not be jumping in our minds to what our response will be. Too many times, even in just a regular conversation, as someone is speaking, we're not even hearing what they're saying because we're already thinking of our rebuttal. We've been watching too many lawyer shows. We all want to be that guy. Well, I got an argument for that. Stop. Listen. Don't respond yet. That's what verse 19 is talking about. That's what it's telling us to do. He even says, you know, he says we listen to people who need to hear them and not be jumping in our minds with our responsibility. But then he says, as we are listening and really hearing someone, we need to choose to take the genuine listening route and not the anger route. Someone might say something that you disagree with. Can you believe that? Someone may have an opinion that doesn't match yours. And for some of us, our response when that happens is, what? How can you think that? You're so wrong. Right? We, we need to be the purveyors of wrongness. And he's saying, no, don't go that route. He says we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get what? Slow to get angry. And we're in a society where we're so quick to get angry, and the last thing we want to do is listen to people. I want to tell you what my opinion is. Right? Just like giving into those temptations, where did those temptations come from? Ourselves, anger is a choice. Our, someone used to say this to me all the time. I don't know where it came from, but our response is our responsibility. No one makes me respond in anger. I choose anger. You may something I disagree with, but you didn't make me get angry. I chose to be angry in response to you. I choose anger. So many times as people might relate a story to me as to why something someone said or someone did made them angry, it's easy when you're not in the situation to kind of be more neutral about it. So my my calm question, and sometimes it makes them more angry, is, and why did you get angry about that? And they, they usually start with, because they fill in the blank. We chose it. And that's something I've even, Jamie and I have been working on this as parents. It's so easy. Man, you know, I told told the girls, pick up your stuff. I told them. I told them seven times, and they didn't pick up. Now, Now I'm angry. They didn't make me get angry. I chose to be angry. How we respond to people is our choice. And when we start putting our response on other people, we're losing responsibility ourselves and accountability to God, and that's a dangerous place to be. So number two, no outside force can make you become angry. You choose anger. He goes on, he says in verse 20, trials produce endurance and anger produces unrighteousness. It's the opposite. And then he talks about hearing the word of God. When we hear that word of God, we need to take action. We need to make actions, number three. We need to make actions to live it out. Not just say we like it and do nothing about it. He relates it to looking in a mirror. We we all do it. We check ourselves in the mirror before we head out the door. Um, I, I, I was joking with our staff this week. 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big, like, food in the tooth guy. So I'm like, if I'm at a restaurant or something, you might wonder, like, I just got to go to the bathroom real quick. So I just, I don't want to be like, hey, guys, and, like, big, like, leafy things are sticking out of my teeth, and it's just, and then I get home, and, and it's still there, and then I think, how many conversations have I had between lunch and home How many people did I smile at? And no one told me. I will say Jordan, he he said he'd tell me. So I appreciate that, Jordan, because he wants to be. So so Jordan's going to hook me up. If we're ever together, he's going to tell me uh, if I have food. But, you know, we check our appearance. But it's like checking your appearance in the mirror. And and, uh, I don't have the issue. I don't have to do my hair right now. But let's just say I had hair, and the hair is just everywhere. And we look in the mirror, and the hair is everywhere. And then I think, I should comb my hair. And then I walk away and do nothing about it. That's like hearing God's word, letting it prick our hearts, letting, it, letting our hearts, you come in, you listen to a sermon, and you think, man, I need to change something in my life. I need to line my life up with God's word. And then we walk out the door and we do nothing about it. That's what James is addressing here. He's saying you need to take actions with what you hear and what you read from God's word. So verse 26, he says, now that you've decided uh, to act on God's word, a big issue that can stand in your way, and we're going to talk about this in other passages, we're just touching on it today, is your mouth. I'm sure no one in here can relate to this one at all of getting ourselves in trouble with what we say. Someone that can control their tongue is again, or that can't control their tongue is deceiving themselves. They say, man, I follow Jesus with all my heart. You you just um, cussed out the policeman. I don't see how the two line up. And that's not me saying that. That's your unbelieving friend saying that. Our lives need to match what we say we believe, and that includes the words that come out of our mouth. Number five, true Christianity. Following after Jesus' example is this, and I just quoted it, to visit orphans and widows that are in need. In other words, to serve those around you without the intention of getting anything in return. even without the intention of the praise of others, even without the intention of a thank you. Here's the deal. We need to serve people in our community before we invite them into a service. Our community needs to know that we will serve them whether they ever step foot in the doors for a service or not. But here's what will happen as we serve them and love them as Jesus did without looking for anything in return. As we do, we, we can invite them into this community and they might at least be willing to listen and consider that invitation. Why? Because you showed that you genuinely care about them and that you didn't tell them to dress a certain way. You didn't tell them to change anything about uh, how they act or what they look like before entering a service you said i want to just love you because jesus loved you can i do this for you god is calling us to act on what he's given us in his word and to serve those around us here's what we're going to do today we're going to pray we're going to have a song and i've asked zach Pastor Zach, to bring the kids in for this last part of our service because we have a church-wide challenge that goes along with this, what we're talking about today. Um, and we want everybody in on it. And so that's, I just want to let you know what's happening. Um, why are the kids coming in? At the end of that challenge, we're going to dismiss the kids back to their classrooms so it's not a chaotic dismissal. Um, you will still pick your kids up from their classes, okay? So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I just want to thank you for today. I want to thank you so much. 
as weird as this sounds, I thank you for humbling me in times that I've needed it, and I know I need more of it. God, forgive me of the times where I've let my mouth be sarcastic. I've let my mouth be rude. I've let my mouth say words that were unkind. And I haven't chosen the right path with you. Lord, I pray that this morning, all over this room, It can't be about what I've said. It has to be about what your word and your Holy Spirit has done. I pray that this morning people would be responding to you and your word and that we would see something big and exciting happening amongst us. We love you so much. In your name I pray. Amen.